The scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 21 through 29. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and cast out demons in your name, and do many deeds of power in your name, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fail fall, because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. The word of God for the people of God. This morning, I want to uh, share with you a little bit about John. Let me talk a little bit about John Wesley first, because I know some of you didn't grow up Methodist, and so you might not know who he is or who he was. John Wesley basically was a Church of England pastor that lived around the time of 17, I don't know when his birthday was, maybe 1705, something in there. And, and then he was, I think, 86 or 88 when he died. So he lived through that, that century, the, the 18th century. And John Wesley was, uh, there's a lot of things you can say about John Wesley. He was passionate about church, and he changed England for sure. And then the Methodist Church came over to the United States, and, and it, uh, he failed miserably here uh, in, in trying to get people to convert to Methodism. And then, uh, but but he, he got some followers, and they came across in Western expansion, and, and the Methodist Church grew from there. So that's a little bit about John Wesley. Now, here's one important story about John Wesley that many of the Methodists know. Uh, He was about 35. He he had failed miserably in the United States or the states at that time. I guess they weren't even states at that time. It was just the colonies, right? He had failed miserably. So he goes back to England, goes back to London, and he is at a church service. He hears somebody speaking about Martin Luther's... um, commentary about the Romans, uh, the book of Romans, and uh, he has a strangely warmed heart, and it changes his life. It changes it for Methodist, and we become um, the people of warmed hearts. That's our religion. So when you see in the bulletin um, this, this quote from John Wesley at the, at the very top, the very last line of that, he, he's, he's complaining, he's critiquing about people who know all about religion. They say they know all about religion, but they don't have a religion of the heart. And so he says, it's possible that one may have no religion at all, even though they believe all these things, and may all the while be as great a stranger as the devil to the religion of the heart. Okay? So that's one piece of the puzzle. And then uh, when you see that song, Be Thou My Vision. That song was picked by Katie and Anna to play today, but they didn't know that my whole sermon was going to be about the religion of the heart. And so the first line of that, Be Thou My Vision, is Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of my heart. Right? So it just became a God thing that that happened. And then uh, in the unison prayer, if you'll just look at the first line of that, O Lord, take possession of my, yeah. And then if you'll look at the sermon title, 
your religion of the heart. I, I put your, your religion of the heart because uh, you don't need to know my religion of the heart. You'll, you get that every Sunday. So uh, it's your religion of the heart that I'm com- really concerned about mostly. Okay, So just a little background about John Wesley and the, all this heart talk. Now, this Bible that you bought for the confirmands, it is awesome. The Methodist Student Bible, NRSV version. The very back, page 1428, there is the general rules of the Methodist Church. Written in 1739, it's been around for a long time. All of you Methodists, lifelong Methodists, you should know these general rules, right? Or not. I will read them for you, just a few of them, because I think they're important and they're good. Uh, And some of them I know you do. For example, and John Wesley wrote these. He said, the taking of the name of God in vain, don't do it. I know most of you don't do that. The profaning the day of the Lord, either by doing ordinary work therein or by buying or selling. Some of you, like me, go to the grocery store on Sunday to buy lunch. Trouble. (laughs) Drunkenness, buying or selling spiritous liquors or drinking them. You're not supposed to do that unless in cases of extreme necessity. Gave you a little break there, didn't he, John? <laughs> Slave holding, obviously, during the 1700s. Ab- abolition was big in England. And so slave holding by Methodists, not supposed to buy or sell slaves. Fighting or quarreling, those kinds of things. This is my favorite, though, and, and I want you to especially take note of this one. Uncharitable or unprofitable conversation particularly speaking evil of magistrates or of ministers. (laughs) That's just good. That's good religion right there. So this is John Wesley, 1739. Of course, uh, in 1739, the world was different, right? He spoke differently. People did different things. In 250 years or 300 years, do you think people will speak differently, do different things? Of course they will. Of course they will. So today, what I want to do, I, 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 I had this critique uh, a, a couple weeks ago in our visioning, and, and a person said, I, I wish that the church would be more biblical. And so I thought, yeah, that, that, that's a good critique, because Jesus was critiquing those people when he said, You who say, Lord, Lord, practicing, playing at your religion, but don't do the will of God, I won't even know you when you get to heaven. And then John Wesley, in that first quote in the bulletin, he says, you might know all the different things about the incarnation or say the creeds or do those different things, but if you don't have the religious, a religion of the heart, you're like the devil. It's a critique of those people who are playing at religion, right? And so uh, I got that critique like, oh, I wish the church was more biblical. And I thought, yeah, I, I, that's, that's great. And so what I've done is I, I, I have decided to do a, a class. Uh, it, it'll be right after Easter, and it'll be at 7.30 to uh, 8.45 or so. And I will use this book. It's called How the Bible Actually Works. And, and it's by Dr. Peter Enns, who is a professor at Eastern University. You don't need to know that, but he is, uh, he's one of the, the great, uh, scholars now, I think, in helping lay people and pastors to approach the Bible in, in ways that I think are really good. Because this is what he says, how the Bible actually works, asterisk, in which I explain how an ancient, ambiguous, and diverse book leads us to wisdom rather than answers, and why that's great news. So, here's what I'm going to do. Everybody who is under the age of 35, you get this book free if you come to the class. Don't think that if you don't come to the class, you're going to get the book, because you're not. you got to come to the class. 
if you're over the age of 65, free book. Okay, so I want people 35 and young, younger, 65 and older, you get the free book. Everybody else, I figure you're working, you can go ahead and afford a book. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to do that, and, and uh, we're going to do it on Sunday nights after Easter through the middle of June. And I hope you can come to that. Even if you come to one or two, it'll be, it'll be good. Because what I think is that we have a certain limited number of tools when it comes to interpreting and understanding the Bible. I think as children, when we go through Sunday school, typically we basically get one or two tools, and I would call them metaphorically a hammer and a saw. Now, if you're going to fix a car, what good is a hammer and a saw? No, you need a wrench, you might need a screwdriver, you might need some clamps, things like that. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm not going to give you those kinds of things. I'm going to give you tools to use to look at the Bible and go, ah, I get it. I get it now because I can tell you that a lot of pastors, all the pastors, they have different sets of tools in their toolbox. And you have different sets of tools in your toolbox. And what he's going to do is simply give you a few more tools to approach the text. Okay? That's basically it. So, got this critique, be more biblical, and I, I thought, yeah, okay, I'm going to do that. So, what I wanted to do today is go back to uh, a, a sermon by John Wesley, it's called Catholic Spirit. John Wesley preached thousands of sermons through his life. Many of them he just repeated, and he would change a few words, but one of the most famous ones that he repeated again and again was called Catholic Spirit not Roman Catholic, Catholic as in universal spirit. And what he was saying was, look, we're going to have differences of opinion, but, and then he used a scripture. And so what I want you to do is take a Bible out of the pew. If you have the New International Version, turn to page 289. I believe it's 289. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 15. Let me see if that's right. Oh, to page 278. 279. Yeah, there it is. Okay? 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 15. You got a new Revised Standard Version. I think there are a few new Revised Standard Versions that sneak their way into the pews. <laughs> All right? This is how it sounds in the King James Version, which John Wesley used. Verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said to him, is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, it is. That's beautiful. Is thine heart right, as my heart is with thy heart? It is. If it is, if it be, give me thine hand. That's beautiful. Now, in the uh, New International Version, what does it say? Scott, verse 15. Say it loud. Is your heart as true to mine as mine is to yours? The one that answered, it is. Is your heart. Which, which version do you have? New Revised. Does anyone have the New International? Good. David? After he left there, he came upon Jehonah. Jehonah? Good. That's good. Are you in accord with me? Are you in accord with me? That's terrible. That's so flat, isn't it? Instead of, is your heart with my heart? If it is, then give me your hand. Are you in accord with me? Well, that's just terrible. It's horrible. I, I, 
here's what I want to say. John Wesley used that line, is thy heart with my heart? If it is, then give me your hand. Saying, all of those people who have different opinions, if your heart is like my heart, we're going to be together, right? That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. That's poetry. It's power. It's pure. You can't beat it. Here's the kicker for all my Methodist friends. When you go to school, to seminary, you get a certain box of tools, and in that box of tools was this. You pastors, before you preach any text, you make sure that you know who wrote it, when they wrote it, who they were writing it to, tell me the context and what was going on in Israel or the Holy Land at the time. That is a few wrenches and screwdrivers for you. And so for us, as we're going through school, we have to ask those questions. Those are the questions that we ask. John Wesley took that line out of context because this is the context. You should know this. This is the context. Jehu, right after David and Solomon were the kings, around 900 or so BCE, before the Common Era, there were then a set of kings, and one of the kings would replace another king. And do you know how they would replace another king? Kill them, exactly right, Kay. And so in chapter 10, it says, Jehu kills 70 people who were the sons of the kings before him. Kills 70 of them, beheads them, takes the heads, put them in baskets, sets them by the gates of the city. 70. Then Jehu goes to kill the rest of the people who were related to King Ahab, kills them all. Then, verse 14, kills another 42, slaughters them. Then he meets Jehonadab on the road and he says, is your heart right with my heart? What do you think Jehonadab is going to say? Absolutely my heart is with your heart. Right? He's going to say that. Because if he doesn't say that, what's going to happen to him? Right. Then Jehu goes, then get up on here into the chariot. We're going to go in the zeal of the Lord. And so Jehonadab is going, I'm getting up in that chariot. And guess where they go? To Samaria. And guess what they do? kill more people. They kill more people in zeal for God. Now, in our time, in our world, we would think to ourselves, this is unbelievable, right? Why choose that text? Is your heart right with my heart? If it is, give me your hand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So John Wesley uses that text, that little text about thy heart, and he creates this whole sermon about people having different opinions about religion, but if they're deeply uh, together down in the heart, then it's going to be okay. So it's out of context. It's basically a proof text. Have you ever heard that word before? Proof text? You take a, a text out of context in the Bible, you use it to make sure that your point is being affirmed or confirmed. That's what it is. And so John Wesley, if I were to critique John Wesley, which I am doing <laughs> right now, I am saying, John, I can't believe that you use this text. I see the poetry in it, but in the context of the story, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. So, Here's the thing. The Bible has been used in a number of ways through history. We all know that. It has been used to justify slavery, right? And it's also been used to abolish slavery. It's been used to keep women down. It's also been used to free women or emancipate women. It's been used to do terrible justice to people. It's also been used to do great things for people. On and on it goes. 
So here is what I would say to you about the Bible. Be careful when you use it. Because people like to throw the Bible at others, saying, this is what the Bible says. And I always want to say, is it? Let's be careful. Because it is diverse and ambiguous and ancient. And in fact, I would say this. 2,800 years ago, when they wrote it, it would be like if we projected ourselves 2,800 years in the future or around the year 4890, and we look back to today and say, ah, this is the world the way it is. Think about 4890. How much change have you seen in the world in the last 50 years, in the last 80 years, if you're 80? Do you think there's going to be a lot of changes between now and 4890? A few. A few. So be careful. Be careful with the Bible and the way that you use it. That's all I want to say. That's all I want you to take away from today. Okay? Amen. Thank you.
The song that um, I'll sing this morning is called, I Walked Today Where Jesus Walked. It's not in the bulletin because we didn't decide to do this until yesterday, so <laughs> we missed the printing. But as I think about the words in this song and sing this song, a number of years ago, Connie and I got to go to Israel, so it brought back very fond memories. So I hope that the words also create uh, some important pictures in your mind uh, and, and as we travel essentially through Linton to Easter. I walked today where Jesus walked in days of long ago. I wandered down each path he knew with reverent step and slow. Those little lanes, they have not changed. A sweet peace fills the air. I walked today where Jesus walked and felt his presence there. My pathway led through Bethlehem, our memories ever sweet. The little hills of Galilee that knew those childish feet. The Mount of Olives hallowed sings that Jesus knew before. I saw the mighty Jordan roll as in the days of yore. I knelt today where Jesus knelt, where all alone he prayed, the garden of Gethsemane, my heart felt unafraid, I picked my heavy burden up. And with him by my side, I climbed the hill of Calvary. I climbed the hill of Calvary. I climbed the hill of Calvary, where on the cross he Today, where Jesus walked and felt him close to 